Today, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 6. Uh, we're in this particular series called Jesus Is, where we are diving into the gospel of John. Now, I'm standing down here for just a moment because we've grown accustomed to doing something around here, uh, something that we say aloud and a lot, uh, because I'm hoping that people will, will remember it. Uh, I've done this at every church that I've been a part of, at every mission field that I've been uh, encouraged to go and, and be with that God has led us to, uh, where I will say life is not about us or life is not about me, and everybody will say, now listen, I want to tell you a funny story about that, okay? Uh, I had a group of students in the church that I was, that I was serving with. And we had been practicing that for years. They knew every time that I would say that, it's all about Jesus. Well, we went to camp one summer. And the camp pastor uh, was really getting into the, into the spirit. He was really preaching. And he said in, his, in the midst of this, in this sermon where it was so quiet, he said, because life is not about me. And all of my kids at one time said, it's all about Jesus. Just in this quiet sanctuary, I could not have gotten any lower into the pew. I was just, but on the other side, you know, I was, I was proud that they got it, you know, that they, they were beginning to understand. So, so let's try that one more time. I just, I just want to hear it one more time. It does a pastor's heart good before he preaches. Life is not about us. But do we believe it? Do we live it? Ah, That's that's where it gets a lot harder, isn't it? Today we're going to be talking about Jesus as the bread of life. You know, in this series that we've been through uh, so far, we've looked at John chapter 1 as Jesus is the word. Uh, Let's look at, at some of the other titles that we might see as we reading through the Gospel of John, you're going to see uh, this word as creator. Go ahead and throw that slide up there, Ms. Theta. Uh, we're addressing two questions, and the first of which being, who is Jesus to you? And then in a few months after Easter, we're going to be digging into who are we to Jesus. But several times throughout the Gospel of John, and the reason why we picked this Gospel to study through is because It tells us a lot about who Jesus is. In fact, the Gospel of John is where we get the seven I am statements of Jesus, where he says things like, I am the door, I I am the sheep gate, I am the good shepherd, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the resurrection and the life. And he says those those types of things. Today we're going to be talking about one of those I am statements, but throughout the first five chapters of the Gospel of John, we see that he is called Word and God and life, light of men, only begotten from the Father, Jesus of Nazareth, Messiah, King of Israel. And last week, we camped out on this idea of Jesus as the Son of Man, which is a term that comes from the the book of Daniel. And this one who came like the Son of Man was given authority to judge and to execute authority over the earth, one like the Son of Man. And Jesus Favorite term for himself is son of man. Uses it some 80 times in the gospel to describe himself. And then as we're going along in chapter 3, you come to this story of, of, oh, well, John the Baptist, which is, you know, me. No, uh, I am John the Baptist, but no, this guy was a guy who lived out in the wilderness and he preached a repentance and he had a baptism of repentance, and he ate locusts and wild honey, and he was just kind of a strange character. And his disciples come to him because they're wondering why John the Baptist is okay with the fact that everybody's going to see Jesus and not him. And he says, you know what? When, when the bridegroom comes, nobody cares much about the best man. They want to see the wedding. It's about the bride and the groom. And Jesus is the bridegroom there, and John says, he must become greater, I must become less. And then Jesus comes to this woman in Samaria by a well, 
and he proclaims to her that he is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the promised one that everybody's been waiting for, even in Samaria. And he describes himself as living water. Now, as much as I wanted to tell that story today, as much as I wanted to dig into chapter four, God would not let me get away from John chapter six. Because John chapter six is where we find kind of the story of John chapter four, and he builds upon it. This idea that when you come to Jesus to be satisfied, he satisfies completely. I mean, don't you like getting the 100% satisfaction guarantee, right? When you, when you buy something and you're like, you know, if you don't like it, you can bring it back and we'll give you all your money back, right? The 100% satisfaction guarantee. Jesus is declaring when he says, I am the living water, I am the bread of life. I am satisfaction guaranteed. So the question then becomes, if we're really going to say that life is all about Jesus, is Jesus enough for you? Are you satisfied with Christ, or do you seem to always be seeking seconds. Now listen, I'm a big old boy. Now, I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina. Uh, I have eaten too much most of my life. Uh, seconds are a part of what it means to go to a buffet, uh, which is standard fare where I come from. You go back for seconds and thirds. But when it comes to following Jesus, when it comes to pursuing him, the problem is Seeking seconds usually means that we're seeking second things. Secondary issues. That we're, that we're focusing on what we're going to talk about today as bread issues. That we can be so distracted by secondary things that we're never really satisfied in who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And so in answering that question, to fight, it's a diagnostic question. Is Jesus enough for you? Are you satisfied in who he is? That diagnostic question, you can look at four areas. That's what we're going to be looking at today. But if you would, go ahead and stand with me. Uh, John chapter 6, we're going to just look at a, at a handful of verses, and then we're going to tackle a whole lot more scripture as we go along. So John chapter 6, starting in verse number 33, I'm going to read this as we stand together, and then we're going to pray. Verse number 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, Give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Heavenly Father, my very simple prayer is that we would come to you, the living bread. That we would pursue you always and that we would not become distracted by all of the secondary issues in our lives. Lord God, would you open ears and hearts and eyes this morning that we might hear from you, that we might see the truth of your word and that we might leave here changed, different, because we have come into your presence. Transform us, Lord, from the inside out. And God, as we open your word, may we see you, may we see Jesus, and may we be filled with the bread of life. If there's anybody here this morning who's never made the decision to follow Jesus as their Savior and Lord, Lord, may today be the day of salvation. May we seek you. May we pursue you always as we glorify you, love one another, serve this world, and make disciples everywhere that we go. We love you. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. You can be seated. Well, listen, I, you know, I don't know uh, what your New Year's resolutions were. But here we are, six weeks into 
2019, how did they go? How are they going? My guess is that you and I probably can't even remember some of the resolutions that we tried to make uh, starting with the new year. In fact, statistics say that about a third of you uh, never even made New Year's resolutions because, you know, uh, we're six weeks in and the rest of us who did make them probably aren't doing so well with them, right? Whether it was lose weight or eat less carbs or, uh, you know, gain some muscle, go to the gym, uh, write a book, uh, you know, just start blogging. I don't know. Whatever your resolutions were, uh, probably did not end so well. But, but here's the thing. Whatever those resolutions were, we must today be resolved to follow Jesus in 2019, to seek him, to know him, to follow him wherever he leads us. And in order for us to do that, we've got to find these, these four ways to find satisfaction in Christ. Now listen, when we look at John chapter 6, there's some some things that you and I need to know, some contextual things uh, that kind of undergird this story. Now, John chapter 6 takes place over about a 24-hour period, and it is an incredibly long chapter, and we're going to tackle a really good chunk of it. Uh, But what I do want you to understand is this is also the chapter where you're going to find a miracle that is recorded in all four of the Gospels. Aside from the resurrection, in fact, it's the only miracle that is recorded in all four of the Gospels, and it's what we commonly refer to as the feeding of the 5,000. And really, it would have been more people than that, because that was only counting the men, not the women and children that might have been in attendance. So somewhere between fifteen and 20,000 people uh, potentially would have been fed uh, by this miracle that Jesus performs. And this is, happens after about a year of ministry in and around the region of Galilee. And so all of these people are really interested in what Jesus has to say and what he's going to do next, but none of them we're ready for that particular miracle. You know, liberal scholars, they try to explain this away. No, the little boy's lunch of what I like to call a fish and chips lunchable, uh, you know, which is five barley loaves and two fish, his little fish and chips lunchable. Jesus takes this and he multiplies it. And the liberal scholars like to say, no, 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 it, it wasn't a miracle. He didn't multiply anything. It was just an example that the rest of the people followed. And then everybody had enough to eat. To which I say, That's not the case. Jesus takes this little boy's lunch and he blesses it and he breaks it and he gives it out and he tells his disciples to go and to serve and to feed. And they do. And when they take up what's left over, there's 12 baskets full. And it's an incredible thing and it's this this incredible story that we see in John chapter 6. And the people were so in awe of what Jesus has done with this feeding of the multitudes that they want to make him their king by force. And so Jesus slips away to go and pray and he tells his disciples, hey, get in the boat and head across the river. Head across the Sea of Galilee and uh, meet me on the other side. I'll be there. So Jesus disappears, the disciples get in the boat, and all the people camp out there for the night. And on the way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, the disciples get caught in a storm. What should have been a 30-minute boat ride takes them six hours because of the wind and the waves, and then they see this figure walking on the water, and they think it's a ghost. And when they bring Jesus into the boat, when they realize that it's him, immediately they're on the shore. Now, the people that are left behind, they have no idea that all of this has happened. In fact, they wake up the next morning, and they're wondering, where 
is Jesus? Where has he gone? Well, what has happened? And so as we come to verse 22, where we're going to kind of jump in, we're going we're gonna to clarify what we've read. We, we see this, this thing that Jesus has said in verses 33 to 35, that he is the bread of life. What in the world is he talking about? What is the context for such a statement? We're, we're going to get there, and we're going to build it like this. You and I, if we're going to seek Jesus, if we're going to ask the diagnostic question, is he really enough, then there are four ways that we can find satisfaction in Christ alone, that we can know for sure that he is indeed enough, that we are feasting on the bread of life. And number one, the thing that we have to do is to check our motives. We have to check our motives. Listen, verse number 22 On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. You see, what they don't know is that Jesus went strolling out on the water and got in the boat with the disciples while they were in the midst of the sea and then immediately brought them to shore because, you know, Jesus is God and he's got it like that. He can do that. Those are the powers that he has over everything. Other boats from Tiberias, the the land of Galilee, came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You know, the scary thing about our relationship with Jesus is that he always knows our motivations. You know, when we serve and we we think we're, we're so good and we do something that makes us feel good and people pat us on the back and we begin to do those things for attention or to check off a spiritual checklist on the box. He knows. God knows our motivations. And Jesus could see through to the heart of this crowd that was seeking to follow him. Were they there to follow him Or did they just want another free lunch? Were they just there for another free meal? And Jesus knew they were seeking him not because of the signs, not because they thought he was the son of God, but because they just wanted another free meal. They wanted to see the next miracle. They wanted to to know what he was going to do next, but it wasn't about Jesus. And listen, we do the same things because we our consumers, because of our culture and our society. How do I know that? Well, in America, we have been trained to be consumers. Consumerism is the social disease that almost no one wants to address. I like to call it affluenza. Not influenza, but affluenza. We are so affluent that it has become a disease to our spirituality. And it's become a national obsession to acquire more and more stuff. On the biggest shopping weekend of the year, think Black Friday, Americans will spend more than half of the total they will give to churches all year. 40% of all food in our country is wasted. More money is spent on fashion accessories in the United States than is spent on college tuition, which explains why there are more malls than high schools. The average American household has more than $7,500 in consumer debt, and half of these have no savings. In the last 50 years, the size of our homes has tripled and typically contain more televisions than people living there. This will hit home for all of us. The average person will spend 3,680 hours, that's five months of our lives, looking for misplaced items because there are more than 300,000 possessions on average in our homes. And has not every parent experienced this one? An average child will accumulate 238 toys by their 10th birthday, and they will play with exactly 12 of them, right? 
I mean, we, we've seen this, and it, we, we even have this. It's integrated into our children. We parent this way. We are consumers. And so often we become spiritual consumers. We treat Jesus like a divine errand boy. God like a genie in a bottle. Diagnose our own prayer lives. When do we come to the Lord most? When we're desperately in need. Instead of because he's worthy. Instead of because he's called us to pray and ask, Lord, give us our daily bread to come to him every day. And we become spiritual consumers. So friends, we've got to abandon this materialistic motivation to follow Jesus because of the things that we think he's going to do for us. It is a lame attempt to get a free lunch when the only time that we come to God is to get something. Let me read something to you that illustrates this point well. You must learn to focus on seeking God before seeking other things. Trusting that when you do, he will give you what you need. It would be wrong to seek the things before you seek him. Imagine a son who takes advantage of his father. This son is out of work and out of money and only goes to see his dad to ask for financial help. What would you think of such a son? You'd probably say he's a dishonorable young man who doesn't love his father but only uses him. Now imagine a son who loves his father. He loves being around his father to share the joys and sorrows of life. He's eager to hear his wisdom and follow his advice. What would you think of this son asking his father for financial help when he fell on hard times? You would likely think it was good that the son had a loving father to help him in times of need, and you would be right. It is a sign of deep committed love when someone seeks help from someone with whom they have a close relationship. It is a sign of corruption to seek help from someone you only look to when you are in trouble. Did you catch that, church? It is a sign of corruption to seek help from someone you only look to when you are in trouble. Jesus is not a divine errand boy and God is not a genie in a bottle. And yet we get so focused on bread issues in our lives. Secondary things that in the scope of eternity don't really matter. At least not the way that God matters. Not the way that our relationship with Jesus matters. Not the way that pursuing him matters. And this lame attempt to get a free lunch has spread to us. So the question that I have to ask you, friends, is bread all you're looking for in Jesus? Are you only looking for the things you think he's going to provide you? Material wealth, a home, some kind of prosperity gospel? Is bread all we're looking for? So the very first thing that we've got to do to be satisfied in Jesus is to check our motives. But we also have to understand that our work is simply to believe. Let's read about that. Jesus says, starting in verse number 27, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? You see, for them, they wanted to hold on to this pursuit of materialism. They wanted to continue to be able to seek the stuff. And they thought... I want to be able to stand before God on my own merit. What works do I have to do? I mean, if Jesus is saying, work for the food that doesn't spoil, that goes on for eternity, then what is that work? So they ask a a valid question, but they think that they can stand before God someday with their checklist all marked out and that it would be okay. What works must we do? Jesus answered them, 
This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Friends, the truth is, you and I are uncomfortable without works. We are. I mean, this is the way that we are raised. We, we want to earn the good grade, right? We, we want to work hard so that we can get the raise. We, we want to be rewarded for our behavior. And grace does not operate according to our works. And it makes us incredibly uncomfortable because we would like to be able to check things off. How many of you are listers. Like at the beginning of the week, you've got to make your list of things that's got to get done so you can check them off. All right. Uh, some of you, I see some hands there. I see your hand. I, you know, I like, I, I understand. I'm that way. All right. I, I'm the lister. I've got to have my notebooks of things that I've got to get done. And I love being able to check those things off or scratch them out because I can see the progress, right? We're like that. We want to see the progress. And what Jesus says is that, no, you can't be a lister in this way. There's not a checklist that you can follow. Your only work is to believe. It's to believe. And I heard somebody say, hallelujah. Why? Why praise the Lord for that when we are so uncomfortable without works? Because it doesn't. Because it's not about us. Because it's not about what we do or don't do. It's not about where we fall short or where we excel. It's about what Jesus has already accomplished. That you believe in him whom he has sent. Your work is to believe. And that word believe is about ongoing faith and trust. It's a relationship with God. Think, think of it like this, all right? Uh, let, let's say that, that you come. Uh, one of my favorite preachers is uh, J.D. Greer. He's the president of the Southern Baptist Convention right now. This is his illustration. I bought, I'm going to steal it today, okay? Uh, so this is his illustration, and they have chairs at uh, the Summit Church there and uh, in a lot of their campuses. And uh, Pastor J.D., he'll get up and he explains it like this, that belief is like when you come into the sanctuary and you sit down on the chair. Now, how do you know that you're trusting in the chair? How do you know that you are satisfied with this chair? How do you know that you believe in this chair, that you have an ongoing trust relationship with the chair that you're in? How do you know? Because I'm sitting in it, right? And, and, And you know what? Here's what didn't happen. All right, and this is where we get kind of all, all caught up. You know what, when I came into the sanctuary, when I, when I got ready to do this illustration, I didn't think, you know, what, what incredible craftsmanship. You know, this looks like a sturdy chair. You know, just, just uh, you know, the color scheme is just fantastic. You know what else I didn't do? I didn't come and I said, you know, chair, please support me. Save me from falling on my behind. You know, that's not what happened. You know how I demonstrate trust in this chair? I rest in it. I take the weight off of myself and I rest in the chair. When you and I come to the gates of heaven, hypothetically, hypothetically, if St. Peter were there, like all of the jokes say he will be, If St. Peter were to ask, why should I let you into heaven? If God were to ask you that question at the end of your life, why should I let you into heaven? The answer should be simple. You shouldn't. You shouldn't let me into heaven. But Jesus, my rest is in Jesus. My faith and my belief and my hope and my trust is in Jesus. I am resting in Jesus. I believe in him, in his finished work on Calvary. Nothing that I could possibly do, Lord, would make it okay for me to be in your holy heaven, except that he said that the work is to believe 
and I do. I placed my faith and my trust in Jesus, and I'm praying, Lord, I know that you'll let me in because, because of Jesus. Sound like a good answer to everybody? That's got to be our answer. That's got to be our faith. That's what Jesus says. Believe. Your work is to believe, but friends, that's not all. It, you can check your motivation, and your work is to believe, but the third thing that you and I have to do is that we've got to be, we've got to rest assured. See, the folks said all of these things. They're, what sign do you offer? You know, our fathers ate the manna in heaven, or as some of our youngins think the donuts from heaven or whatever, you know, that's, that's great. I like that, that translation. Uh, that must be from the Message Bible. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. And that's when Jesus begins to declare, I am the bread of life. Verse 35, whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But it's not just about checking our motivations. It's not just about working as our belief. It is that you and I have to rest assured. Rest assured. In the chair, right? That's the illustration. We've got to rest assured in what Jesus has already accomplished. Here's what it says. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. So he's condemning them. He knows their hearts. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Thank you, Jesus, that he will never cast us out when we come to him. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know, how does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Friends, the God who saves us is the God who keeps us. One of the most incredible and personal promises that you and I have from Scripture is the doctrine of eternal security. And I will stand on it on the foundation of the Word of God forever because of verses like those. It wasn't about me to begin with. God called me God drew me and he saved me. And because salvation is all about him, that means my security rests in him. Amen? Amen. It isn't about me. That's, that's our salvation. That's our eternal security. He's the one that holds it all together. He is holding on to us. And, and friends, I gotta tell you, this is, a, this is a confusing piece of scripture. And there are people that debate this all day long. They, they ask the questions about God's sovereign election or man's responsibility. Here, here it is, right? He says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. All the father gives me will come to me. So is it man's decision to follow Jesus, or is it God's sovereign election of that person? Does God draw the person, or is it whosoever will decide? Let's settle that debate right here today, once and for all. You know what the answer to those questions are? Yes. Yes. It is not an either or it's I have no idea how the sovereign election and the free will of human beings cooperate together in salvation. But I do know this. God is the author of salvation. 
He is the sustainer of my salvation. I am secure in him. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Guess what, friends? There are things in scripture that we are never going to know the answers to simply because, you know, as I like to tell my wife, I'm, I'm educated beyond my intelligence. I'm just not quite smart enough to figure this out. I can't wrap this up for us in a nice box in a bow. It just doesn't work that way. These are secret things that belong to the Lord. But the thing that I know is that God draws a person, that he keeps them, that no one will ever be able to snatch us out of the hand of our good shepherd. And isn't that amazing, Grace? I may not know the intricacies of how all of this works in the mind of God and the hearts of men, but I know the God that calls us. I know the God that is calling you today. That God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So what's this big deal about bread? You know, it wasn't lost on me as I was studying for this passage of Scripture that uh, last week I announced to you all uh, that I have recently been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and here I am today uh, proclaiming that Jesus is the bread of life. Like the whole bottom part of that pyramid that Theta uh, shared with the kids today, that's off limits for me. Uh, you know, I, I've got to do that really sparingly at this point, uh, that I, I, I've spent too long eating too much of that. Uh, good stuff like donuts and cake and you know, breads, and I'm not bitter, I promise. What's the big deal about bread? You know, the problem is we are uh, culturally divided from the time in which this was stated. Because for us, bread is, uh, it's a side dish. It's not really even necessary. We don't have to have bread at our meals, Right? Uh, most of the time we use bread to sop up gravy when we're done with, you know, breakfast. We, we use bread like a, a scoop to get the rest of the stuff on the plate onto our fork or our spoon, right? That's, that's our, our use for bread. But in ancient times and in the first century, bread was a staple of their diet. Bread was the difference between life and death for many people. And so when Jesus says that he is the bread of life, when he compares himself to manna from heaven, he's saying, I am the one that brings spiritual nourishment to you. I am the bread. It was not a side dish. It was a staple of their diet. But it's not the only thing that Jesus says. Let's kind of skip down to verse number 51. Jesus says this, he takes this idea of being the bread of life, the living bread, and he goes a little bit further, and this is where he begins to uh, lose some folks. Because up to this point, he's asked them to check their motives. He said, you know, not only do you have to check your motives, but work to believe, and you've got to rest assured, but now he's inviting them to participate in his own life and death. And he begins to lose folks on this one. In fact, when he gets done preaching this particular passage, when he teaches on the bread of life, it's so difficult that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people abandon Jesus, even some of his closest followers. And Jesus, after seeing the absence of the people, after they leave because of this teaching, he looks at his disciples and he asks this question, are you going to leave too? And they said, Rabbi, where else are we going to go? You have the words of truth. This is where it gets difficult. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Say what, Jesus? 
The, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. What in the world is going on? This gospel that Jesus has been proclaiming now has become a gospel of cannibalism? I don't understand this. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. This is is the bread. I can see Jesus as he's teaching in the synagogue. This is the bread that comes down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died because that was manna. I mean, it was bread from heaven and it provided nourishment for a day, but those people still died. Whoever feeds on this bread, Jesus' bread, will live forever. And Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. And it was almost a drop the mic, close the Bible moment in the synagogue when Jesus said these words. Can you imagine being there that day? Put yourselves in the shoes of these first century Jewish people as they sit in the synagogue and they hear Jesus teaching, eat my flesh and drink my blood. I am true food and drink. How would you feel? What would you think? It's disgusting and disturbing. And that is the way so many of the people took it. So the question is, when did the gospel of Jesus Christ become a gospel of cannibalism? It didn't. Jesus was using perhaps the most powerful metaphor that he could possibly use to demonstrate what it means to be satisfied in Jesus, to participate in his life and in his death, his flesh, that we would be people that live like him. In fact, he uses two different words. In, in verse number 53, he says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. The word for eat in that verse is one Greek word, and it's in the past tense, and it's a one-time deal. And the idea is that we participate in the life and death of Jesus Christ upon our salvation. We rest and what he has accomplished because of his sinless life and substitutionary death on the cross to die in place of you and me. And so we partake in a one-time salvation. But then it says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. He changes the Greek word that he uses it's not eat anymore. It's this other word, feed. It, it, in fact, it's got the connotation of munching. The idea that we continually go to Jesus to be fed by his word in prayer, in meditation, in worship, that we're constantly grazing upon the grace and mercy of God, that we are munching on what matters most every single day. So Jesus uses this powerful metaphor that says, so when Jesus tells them to eat his flesh and drink his blood, and this is a quote by Heath Lambert, a, a commentarian, it's his way of saying to the crowds, don't you get it? You are obsessed with bread. You need to be captivated by me. I am what you need. Come to me. Don't look to me for what I can do for you. Seek me. In graphic terms, when we believe Jesus is who he said he is and did what he said he did, we are consuming him the way he commands. When we 
believe. When we participate in the flesh of living like Jesus, and when we participate in the blood, his atoning sacrifice that set us free from sin and death, we are eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And yes, it may be a disturbing metaphor, but a powerful one it is. And it's one that we symbolize every single month at Oak Grove Baptist Church like we did last week when we partook of communion, the Lord's Supper. When we come together at the Lord's table where Jesus would later on the night that he was betrayed, took bread and blessed it and broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup and he poured it out. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we partake of the flesh and blood of Jesus, we are partaking of that death and saying he is coming again. And we're gonna live like him. Verse 60 When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Who can understand this? Friends, life is not about us. Is it? Do we believe it? Do we live it? if we're going to pursue him, if we're going to be satisfied in him every single day, then friends, we're going to have to check our motives. And not only are we going to have to check our motives, we're going to have to do the work of believing. Giving up the checklists, stop trying to do it by your merits and your works, but do the work of believing and rest assured that the one who saved you is the one who keeps you. That you are secure in who Jesus is and what he has accomplished on Calvary's cross. He overcame death in the grave and we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. And friends, we've got to participate in the life and death of Jesus Christ. So that's the question. Are you satisfied? Or do you keep looking for seconds in the world? Maybe your decision to follow Jesus, you you thought like a spiritual consumer. You know, I'm going to make the decision to follow Jesus. I I believe that he died and that he rose again. I want to get my fire insurance. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Maybe, Maybe that was you. And you made a decision like that. And at the altar, you said, Lord, I believe in you. I trust in you. My hope is in you. But by the time that you got to the doors, you said, I'll take it from here, Lord. So many of us, so many of us can be guilty of that line of thinking. So friends, what step do you need to take today to be satisfied truly in who Jesus is, to say that he is more than enough for you. Maybe today you just need to check your motives. Why am I even here? Why do I even pray? And when do I pray? Evaluate your prayer life. Today, maybe you need to do the work of just believing placing your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe there's somebody here today who has never made the decision to follow Jesus Christ and they've never placed their faith and their trust in him to receive the free gift of eternal life. Maybe that's you today. Or maybe today you just needed to hear the hope of your eternal security that you can rest assured that if you have placed your faith and your trust in Jesus, 
He's got you in the palm of his hands. No matter what you're going through, no matter what storm might be on the horizon, he's there. He's holding you. He's walking with you. He's carrying you. Or maybe today you need to walk out of this this sanctuary, this holy place, this morning, saying, God, I'm gonna follow you no matter what you call me to do. I am participating in the flesh and blood of Jesus' ministry. I want to participate in his life and death. Friends, pursue Jesus, meaning seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of the seconds, all of the secondary things will be added unto you. But seek first Jesus.